What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're going to be learning about the did set feature in Swift. It's been a while since I've done a video, been very busy. If you're ready for this video, drop a like down below, hit subscribe. Let's talk about what did set is and let's do some examples. So we're going to work directly in Xcode and create a new project here. We're going to do some real world examples, none of that theory stuff today. We're going to stick with a app template under iOS and I'm going to go ahead and call this did set examples. Go ahead and stick with UI kit and storyboard for today's video. We'll go ahead and create it. I'll save it on my desktop here. And as soon as Xcode decides to stop being slow, we'll close this right panel and I'll go ahead and expand my window. So did set like the name implies is a way to invoke a block of code when a property is assigned to. Now this is powerful for a bunch of reasons. Now let's take a look at two of them that are practical use cases today. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file to get started. We're going to stick with the Cocoa Touch class. I'm going to go ahead and call this custom label view. It's going to inherit from UI view. Now this view, we're going to wrap a label inside of it. We're also going to put a score property in here. So let's say our score by default is zero. And let's say we also have a private uh, label in here. So I'll go ahead and say label is a UI label, nothing too fancy. Just make sure it is private to better understand the point of this did set business. We'll go ahead and update our initializer. And I'm also going to go ahead and add the label as a sub view. I'll also go ahead and maybe we'll say labels text alignment is centered and I'll bump up the label font size here as well so everyone can see it nice and large we'll go with 32 don't forget to bring in the other required initializer with the coder otherwise you're gonna get a error and of course don't forget to actually lay out your labels view aka layout sub views we'll just say label dot frame equals bounds now this is pretty simple, pretty straightforward uh, custom view here. We're gonna go into our controller and I'm gonna throw a instance of this onto our view hierarchy. So we'll go ahead and say custom is an instance like that. We're gonna go ahead and add a sub view for it. So custom, don't forget to give this guy a frame. So we'll stick with zero, zero, 250. And I'm also gonna go ahead and just center it view dot center just like that go ahead and give this a run i think i've already got a 12 pro max simulator up and running there it is and we should see a label with the number zero in the middle of our screen now how do we go about actually updating this label well traditionally you would say something like custom which is our view instance dot label dot text equals something now that's perfectly fine, but it can't work here in our case because our sub view of our label is private, but our score is actually the thing that is driving the text of our label. So this is where we can bring in did set. So we're gonna open up curly braces right there, and this is not to be confused with a computed property, even though they look similar. Notice the equal before the value here, the initial value. We're gonna bring in did set, and this is where we can actually say label.text is going to equal score. So the term did set here is honestly pretty self-explanatory. This block of code gets invoked whenever this value is assigned to, whenever the setter, hence set, uh, is called. So did set gets called after the value has changed. Now I'll also mention a tidbit in this video. There is also something known as will set. Will set gets called before the setter is called and before the new value is assigned to score. So this will get called when I say score equals one right before it updates it from zero to one. So we're going to focus on did set since it's a far more common and more interesting to use. So back in our view controller, Let's see, so we don't see our zero here, so let's see what's going on. Either our simulator is being slow or I forgot to do something. I think we forgot to assign the default label text here, which we did. We're gonna say label.text equals score. So when the view first gets initialized, it should equal the starting score, so there is our zero. Now back in our view controller, what we're gonna do is maybe after perhaps like two seconds, we're gonna go ahead and say, all right, label, go ahead and update yourself, but we're not going to actually update the label text directly. That's gonna get updated implicitly by us changing the score. So we're gonna say score is maybe 32 because we're doing awesome at whatever game this is and we're definitely winning so after two seconds we expect to see this to go to 32 which in fact it 
does. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward, little debatable that this is a great pattern because we're now holding a view model level data directly in the view, but this is more or less to illustrate the example. Now let me do another example, and this is where things get, I think, particularly interesting. So there is this common pattern known as Redux, or reactive pattern, which is popular in both Combine, SwiftUI, and it's not something new or novel. So we're gonna create an object up here. I'm gonna go ahead and call it a struct observer. It's gonna perhaps take in a generic value. Now, if you're not familiar with generics, no need to panic. I'll explain this as we go. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, this observer thing can wrap any type of value that we've just called T. Now, the idea here is whenever the value changes, we wanna call a block that is observing the value. So right now we have this observer thing, which makes sense. It's a struct, so we can go ahead and uh, exclude the initializer. It should automatically get picked up. But the important thing that we want to go ahead and do is we want to go ahead and say func add. And I'm going to go ahead and say observer. And this observer is going to take in an escaping block, which will pass back the updated value of t, just like that, as well as uh, going to return void. Now, what do we actually do with this block that we passed in? We're actually going to hold on to it. So the observer, let me call this observer block actually to be a little more uh, explicit about naming. This is going to equal this type of closure here. So we're gonna say self.observer block is observer. And whenever the value of t gets assigned to, we're gonna go ahead and say observer block go ahead and invoke yourself with the current value of t. Now, this might be a little confusing, but let me hook it up to a really practical example, which in our case is going to be, and this should be value actually, which in our case is going to be a table view. So this is probably yelling at me because we're in a struct and we can't assign uh, to a immutable value, it needs to be mutating. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make our life simple, make this a class, and I'm also going to add a initializer, which is going to take in t, we'll say self.value is value just like that. Notice private uh, for our observer block. This particular example can only have one block at a time, which is fine, but let's actually hook this up and see it in action. So let's say we have a uh, array of strings and we want to show them in a table view. So maybe I'll say fruits here, and this is going to have things like apple, and we'll say oranges, and we'll also say, what else is a good fruit? Grapes, I guess. So here is our list of grapes. And let me go ahead and create a table view here. We're gonna want to conform to a table view's data source so we can plumb the data in. We'll go ahead and create said table up here. We'll say table is going to be of type table view. And again, I'm only doing the table view example since it's very practical, but this, uh, this overall observer pattern with the did set is highly, highly reusable and you can use it to build out really powerful things. And in fact, this is how RX Swift is built under the hood. So we're gonna go ahead and register a cell to this. All of this table view stuff is you know generic of uh, this observer and did set pattern. It's just a standard table, so I'm not gonna go into it too much. If you're not familiar with table views, I encourage you to take a look at my several other videos on table views. I've honestly got more than I can even count. We'll go ahead and update the view hierarchy, assign its data source, and we're gonna say number of rows. This is simply going to be fruits.count, and then cell for row at index path. In here, we're gonna go ahead and DQ a cell. If I can stop making typos, table view, come on Xcode, table view. See, I wish it would give me the one that I want as the first option instead of uh, the weird autocompletes. So we're gonna say DQ cell with identifier cell and index path. And what are we gonna do in here? We're gonna assign the text labels text. So we'll say text label text. And this guy is basically gonna be the nth fruit in our array. And finally down here we can uh, return said cell. So here we're gonna say index path dot row and here I'm gonna return the cell. So if we go ahead and give this a run, we should see a pretty basic table view with three options in it, which in fact we do. Now where the heck does this observer thing come into play? Now this is pretty cool in my opinion. So let's say we go ahead and we're gonna make this fruit, we're gonna make this an observer 
that can actually take in a value. So we're going to take in a value of that array. Now instead of saying fruits.count, we're going to say fruits.value and the value here is going to be our array. We're going to say fruits.value.count. Now since it's optional, we're going to go ahead and say zero. And down here, once again, we're going to say fruits dot value and that value is going to be an array we're going to get the nth element in that collection now because value is optional we're going to go ahead and put the question mark there so if you go ahead and give this a run it is still going to show you the exact same table but here is a really cool part because we have the did set in here Every single time we update the underlying value array in fruits, our table will reactively update. So how on earth does that work? So we're going to go ahead and first and foremost, we are going to register an observer on our fruits. So we're going to say fruits. And again, we added this add observer block, this function right here. And all we're doing is we're passing in a block that gets invoked every time value is set. So we're going to say whenever value is set, we get updated fruits in here. So I'm going to go ahead and print this out here. We're going to say updated fruits. And I'm going to go ahead and simply print this out with maybe some line breaks to accommodate for readability. And every time this is updated, what we really essentially want to do is we want to go ahead and uh, update our table view. And we want to do that on the main thread since uh, this is, in fact, a UI operation. And we also don't want to capture self in a strong capacity. Otherwise, we're going to leak memory. So we're going to say self.table. And we're just going to tell it to reload its data. Now, whenever we update fruits, we can go ahead and uh, see this in action. So what we are going to do is we're going to say dispatch queue uh, main, and we're going to say async after. We'll go ahead and say now plus maybe two seconds. We're going to go ahead and start appending to fruits. So we're going to say fruits. Whoops. We're going to say append. And let's go ahead and actually append something to this. We actually want to append it to the value of fruits. So we're going to say value dot append and we want to append a single element. So we want the other version of append. So we're going to say append and we don't want contents of we want this one here. Let's go ahead and append maybe watermelon. And let's also go ahead and let me actually put this in a for loop. And what we can do is we can append a few things to see how it looks. So we're going to say for x uh, in 0. And let's say we're going all the way up to 2. We'll go ahead and append a new element. And this is going to be uh, now plus 1 second uh, plus maybe we'll go ahead and actually multiply this 1 second. So we'll say 1 times time interval of x. So we're going to say 1 times time interval of x, just like that. And this is basically going to uh, update the value every single time. Let's see what's going on here. This is dispatch q dot main uh, dot async is the other thing we need here. All right, looking good. And this fruits here is yelling at me. It might be optional, so I'm going to coalesce it so we get that warning to go away. Now let's go ahead and give this a run. Let me also expand my console so everyone can see what's going on down here. Go ahead and make that much bigger. And we expect to see after a couple seconds, uh, two or three times, it's going to update and append watermelon, which in fact it did. Now that's interesting. Let's make this longer. And let me actually go ahead and what we can actually do is we can say, uh, let's see, let me create an array up here of some more fruits and we're going to get a random element every time. So we'll say more and this is going to be watermelon. I feel like there's more grapes. Let's see. Let's see. We did grapes already. Cherry. Let's go ahead and do some peaches. And what we can do down here is we're going to say go ahead and append one of these dot random elements. We'll go ahead and uh, build. Looks like that is giving us an error because it's optional. So we'll say here something else. Now we're going to see iteratively this is going to update. And the coolest thing about this is the table view is automatically updating as a byproduct of us updating the value of this fruits. Now, I understand that this is definitely a little more involved of an example, but again, to take it all the way, uh, you know, full circle, the power and the ability for us to do this comes from this simple guy right here. Super simple, yet really powerful. Did said is a lifesaver when you want reactive patterns or you want to make sure that some function gets called as a byproduct of some property assignment changing. 
So hopefully that example was well put together and I wasn't too all over the place. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions, if that didn't make sense for any reason. If you haven't dropped a like already, make sure to do so. I know I've been really busy lately. I haven't been able to put out a video in like a week, which is pretty unheard of for me. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're into iOS Swift, Swift UI, anything tech related to stay tuned for new videos. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you all on the next one.